Hello, my name is uh, Julio Santos and I am a co-founder at Fractal. Uh, we're hard at work build building the Fractal protocol uh, so that we can enable radical data markets and help keeping the web open and free for everyone. Joining me today is Stefan George. Uh, he's a co-founder and CTO of Gnosis. He's a true OG and I'm very excited to, that he took the time to join us today. So my first question, Stefan, is did, did I pronounce your name right? Is Stefan okay? Great pronunciation, yeah. All right, excellent. My German is not the best, but I try. <laughs> could you uh, could you tell us a bit about yourself? I don't want to be the one like introducing you. Sure, yeah. Uh, I'm Stefan. I got involved in crypto very early on 2013. Uh, at that time, there was only Bitcoin, and we built some applications around Bitcoin. And yeah, and then in 2014, we we knew about Ethereum and we saw potential to kind of replicate the application that we built for uh, for Bitcoin specifically a peer to peer prediction market um, on yeah on Ethereum um, by removing ourselves as being the middleman in this market and uh, or the custodian in this market and um, that's how we started Gnosis as part of Consensus spun off from Consensus in 2017 doing an ICO. And since then, we developed yeah, different software for Ethereum, including prediction markets, smart contract based wallets, um, and different decentralized exchange mechanisms. Um, and with decentralized exchange mechanisms, we specialized on yeah, like batch auctions, it's like a specific exchange, which allows to um, have a fair price finding for everyone trading in a decentralized fashion. All right, thank you. So uh, I uh, I heard from a little bird that you recently moved to uh, to Lisbon. Um, I'm from Portugal myself, so I completely wow. see the appeal and the point. Uh, how has my country been treating you so far? So far, great. Uh, we love it in Lisbon. Um, it's great culture, great food, great weather. How's, how's the crypto scene over there? It's growing. So a lot of people recently moved to Portugal. I think quite a few people got tired of where they were at during COVID and the lockdowns. Yeah. And so many decided to move on and many decided to come to Lisbon and settle down here. So I think you might have maybe something like a hundred crypto related people in Lisbon right now, which for our industry, of course, already significant amount. Yeah, it's quite big. Cool. Um, so let's uh, let's talk a little bit about Gnosis and the, and the history there. So like uh, Gnosis is one of the first applications of Ethereum. It was one of the, so when I came into Ethereum, it was one of the first things that I heard about uh, and that got me excited about the space. I'm, I'm, I'm a huge fan of prediction markets. Uh, Fractals, Treasury is managed with SAFE and I'm pretty sure just like everybody else is, right? Um, so like um, what are what are some of the favorite things that you guys built over over this this long period, and what are uh, what are some things that you learned that are, are important insights for other folks building in this space? Yeah, yeah. So we obviously started with prediction market. That was the mission uh, for our ICO as well, um, and we built several versions of prediction markets. But we had to realize uh, that none of them really was successful or got meaningful adoption, and. Um, that actually was not only the case for Gnosis as prediction market, but also for every competitor. And I think what we realized is that many, many people find the interest, uh, the, the concept of prediction market super interesting, and uh, they are interested in the outcome of prediction markets in terms of what the prediction actually is, but participation has been very low. And I think that's because there's two reasons why people participate in prediction markets. One is entertainment reason, like sports betting, political betting, and the other reason is if you actually have, if you think you have insider information, <laughs> uh, otherwise you're not going to participate. And um, we really tried hard to, to, to like push for information markets, basically markets that will incentivize others to reveal the information. So kind of this insider market. Um, but there you have a huge issue of funding, like someone has to fund it and the person funding it is losing money on those markets. And there's just very few use cases where um, yeah, where this currently applies. And that's why uh, I think very few markets actually got meaningful adoption. Uh, most markets were not profitable for market makers. Um, and since today, there's also no good market maker integration for entertainment markets like sport markets or political betting. You need adoption, <laughs> obviously, that's pretty obvious, but uh, you also have to 
maybe uh, react faster if you don't see any adoption. And I think it's important to first try like with very simple versions of the product to see if there is something. And if not, then yeah, be, be ready to make drastic changes. So for prediction markets, for example, we try to be uh, fully regulated and we never got a license. So it took us a lot of time and uh, we could never really validate the use case uh, until, until this point. And um, that kind of made us, I think, waste a lot of time and resources on prediction markets where uh, there was clearly no market in the end. Um, yeah, and then for a, a very good other example of how it should be maybe is like the multisig that we built. That is something that took only a few days to build. <laughs> <laughs> and it got super successful. So that's kind of how other <coughs> should usually operate. And um, yeah, that's a very good. Uh, it's also like it's something that we built for ourselves. It's also not a bad lesson. Like if you need something and you build something that's good for your company, most likely it will be helpful for others too. So that's also a way how you can start thinking about ideas for startups that can become very successful. And yeah, for the multisig, we kind of we did this and we extended on the use case with a safe. And now it's like a very successful product. Um, basically anyone's using it for fund management. Um, and uh, and then the third product line sort of is uh, decentralized exchanges. And there, I think also like we, we built exchanges for many years and we actually were the company that invented the constant product formula that is mm -hmm. used by, by many exchanges like Uniswap. Uh, but we built it and then we just never... I mean, that, that's like, what V1 we, is all about, right? The main net, like we, we, had, we haven't implemented the GitHub repository still in our GitHub organization uh, from way early days, much before Uniswap even existed. Uh, and we never, we never tried to actually put it on chain because we thought it's like flawed, like mechanism-wise it would be flawed because prone to mine extractable value. A topic that was until recently not a concern for anyone mm -hmm. <laughs> and so i think sometimes uh, just try things out um, and see how it goes uh, and we clearly did not in this case which was a pity <laughs> in retrospect uh, and then we built other exchanges which were much more complicated uh, from a game theoretical point of view much better but just too complicated for people to understand and um, that's why they did not get the adoption that we wished for and that's maybe something where uh, like, yeah, we should have thought more user-centric, like is the end product that we get to, is this actually something anyone wants? <laughs> and uh, yeah, well, we learned our lessons and now we have an exchange, which is uh, quite popular. It's called CowSwap, um, which kind of combines uh, like fair mechanism design with ease of use. Um, but yeah, I think could have arrived at this earlier. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, I, I hope you guys eventually figure out the prediction market bit or somebody building on top of you because like th there's this mounting awareness that there this information is a threat and uh, I, I would expect that to precipitate adoption of anything that facilitates information discovery um, and it's something that I'm still very much expecting. I, I don't think there's a, a UX issue in prediction markets in particular or a lack of need. Uh, it's more like the access to the space in general is something that is still complicated, right? Um, yeah. And I think that we will, as... Uh, uh, as UX in crypto um, improves overall, I think that that is going to be reflected in prediction markets themselves because this is a use case outside of crypto, right? Like where, wherever governments didn't manage to shut it down, it exists. Um, so it's definitely something that people want and I'm very happy that it's your team uh, building it. Um, all right. Uh, so uh, we at Fractal, we have not been around nowhere near as long as Noses, uh, but we're, we're very proud to, to have helped teams like yours and Oceans with identification services. And I want to talk a little bit about uh, about that. Uh, the, um, until until recently, uh, we worked only as a kind of as a verified federated identity provider. So like you know, log in with Facebook, but uh, with a verified identity. It's an OAuth process. But as part of the protocol build out, we finally did something that was in the roadmap for a long time, which was to issue self sovereign identity credentials to our users, so they can present them to any relying party uh, without our involvement or without our knowledge even, which is great. Um, and this is because we believe decentralization is, is important. And uh, in this case in particular, so that like whatever happens to us, these credentials will be valid and they will work out going forward. Um, uh, and also because like um, there will always be use cases uh, in our opinion where um, I, tying an address to a person in meet space is going to be critical. 
So first, there's the obvious case of KYC for regulatory compliance, right? And uh, while, while as long as regulation keeps pushing developers into requiring their cu customer identification for their applications, then we believe that we should help developers and users navigate this requirement as easily as possible rather than you know, being excluded. So that's where we can add value and that's where we're helping out as well. And we've been doing that for a few years. I'll give you an example. Like DUI DUX um, is uh, uh, has recently announced uh, uh, an airdrop, uh, and the US users are excluded. They've got regulatory concerns, um, and I don't even know how they're excluding US users. Uh, but that that's a different story. Allegedly, they are right, and like. Um, as somebody tweeted the other day, like, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> call your representative and ask why you're being protected from free money. Um, but uh, in these cases where a KYC could help with inclusion, I think that it should help. And I think that's, uh, that's part of what we're here to do as well. Um, and we've recently seen, and last week as well, like increased regulatory scrutiny in this space. Um, so how do you how do you see this this regulatory encroachment in, in crypto uh, and how do you think that that is going to to evolve? Yeah, very good question. Um, I mean, obviously, it seems the regular regulators get a bit more serious. We saw it with Uniswap recently. Um, they had to uh, yeah, delist a few tokens. And I think we see probably two paths forward. One is the yeah, the fully like regulated path where um, companies like Uniswap are trying to embrace uh, regulators um, and collaborate on KYC and so on and so on. And I think that's good for two reasons. One is um, ultimately like the biggest part of users is still out there without even touching crypto and for them to make it more easily accessible they will probably have to go through other platforms like uh, Uniswap is talking to, I think, uh, like PayPal and mm -hmm. Stripe and so on to see how, how Uniswap could be directly integrated into their platform. And uh, for this, obviously, you need something like KYC. Uh, of course, there's also, there's also reasons why you would like to have <laughs> regulation. <laughs> like preventing money laundering and such. So it's not like it's terrible to be regulated. Um, so that's kind of the one way I see it, like uh, projects starting, like bigger projects will have to start embracing regulators um, and will have to offer versions which are fully KYC, etc. And I think it will also open potentially the path to new customers. Um, and the other path is the fully decentralized route, which will also uh, become much stronger. There's much bigger need for having better decentralization uh, for having more decentralized infrastructure. Uh, the graph is working on this, ENS is working on this, IPFS is working on this. So this will also just be another push and accelerator for those technologies to emerge and mature. Um, but it's pretty clear like the market leaders uh, will have to <laughs> will have to embrace regulation, have to introduce KYC on some level, but there will always be also the decentralized version and uh, those will also just yeah, accelerate, I think, and mature faster because there's a need to to be one of those. Yeah, it uh, it will uh, it will make some things harder and it will slow down some stuff, but it will also help bring some uh, like a veneer of legitimacy that might be missing for a bunch of folks to or the next generation of folks to one board into the space. Uh, going back to to the adoption that we were talking about before. Um, and and I also think that there's there's other there's issues other than KYC that uh, that identity helps solve. Like uh, for example, if you uh, if you imagine a DAO that's tied very uh, very tightly to a meat space community, like you know a neighbor neighborhood governance, for example, then you know I probably want to know who's voting, and I, I probably want logic like one person one vote to be enforced rather than um, giving a whale uh, unilateral power to to decide an outcome. Um, and in some scenarios, uh, it is not ideal that um, you know, we go for the rich get richer kind of uh, scenario. So, for, for example, if, if we run political elections on chain, uh, quadratic voting or otherwise, it's probably very important to assure participants uh, that uh, each every other participant corresponds to a human in, in meat space and not just to, to one address. Um, like, what do you think about this? Do you, do you agree? Do you think that um, there's, there's, there's something else here that I'm missing? Uh, totally, we need the possibility to identify humans, um, but there are different paths to this. So I don't think it has to be like this government regulated KYC process necessarily. There's also this project of um, proof of humanity DAO, for example, 
uh, there are circles as this UBI project, which also kind of creates an identity, um, which is kind of preventing civil attacks. Mm -hmm. And so I think there are many paths to preventing civil attacks. Um, and KYC, like centralized KYC is only one path, which will also happen for sure, but I hope it's not the only one. Yeah, <laughs> like me too. I would wish uh, that we don't have again, like this one entity deciding on this. Me too. Uh, the And uh, additionally, like KYC doesn't have to be centralized, but it also normally as it's defined, like it's a very burdensome project. Like I, I need one or more identity documents from you, often a proof of address. It's it's huge, right? And it's uh, something that is yeah. not exactly friendly to the user. Uh, there's many other ways of approaching this problem, and, and biometrics are one of them, right? I know I need to. If all I need to do is that you're unique and that you exist, um, then there is much more that I can look at than a, a document that a government issues you. Um, and I think that we have the technology to do that now uh, and to make this a lot less burdensome and a lot less invasive on on your privacy as well. Um, do you see any do you see any use cases in prediction markets that could benefit from one person one vote? Uh, no, <laughs> I don't think so too. I think in that case, like the 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 more confident anybody, people, entity, group is about their information. That's that's the only factor that matters, right? Yeah, it only matters that people who have access to capital information can participate. But there's no advantage in limiting this. And it's quite the opposite. If we had KYC markets, they would not be as reliable as open markets. Yeah. Uh, because why do you think that is? Well, the more money and the more information people have can access the market. Um, yeah, the more liquid the market is, the more incentives there are for everyone to participate. It's just ah. the more efficient market. I thought you were going to say something else. I thought you were going to be like, well, if people are identified, maybe they don't want to speak out their true opinion. Um, which might also be the case sometimes, I imagine, uh, especially if you hold information that you're not supposed to hold. <laughs> True, but I think KYC would always come for me with like the restriction of market access, uh, so that I would see the bigger concern. Um, it might also be the opposite, that some markets would perform better with KYC because uh, parties that have knowledge and capital cannot participate because of KYC requirements, but I figure probably people that have the knowledge will do it anyways one way or the other <laughs> yeah i think so too from a ux perspective it's always going to be an annoyance it's always going to be something extra on the path to what the user want to do um this will be relevant where there's regulation involved or where there is um i don't even know how to call this but like um, somebody that's creating a market might choose to say, look, I am i don't know who's voting on the other side. I'm not comfortable with this, with the idea of any address being able to, to, to vote here, right? And and so it, I'm not saying this makes any sense. I'm just saying that the, this perception uh, might be another poll, but in general, um, I agree with your statement for sure. Um, so um, something else that I wanted to that I wanted to ask you, and going back to the attention uh, or to the, to the adoption topic, um, I, I think that for me the the thing that attracts me most to this to this area uh, to crypto is the ability to help all of us work together better. Like I, I feel like we've maxed out available coordination tech, and that uh, <laughs> blockchains can kind of help bolster it a little bit for the twenty first century and beyond. Perhaps we can you know like prevent that. We can make sure that we don't destroy each other. We can we can go past the great filter, right, and thrive as a civilization one day. And um, it's a bit washy washy, obviously, but like it's 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 um, it's a big driver for me, and it's a big motivation for me. And the space is full of brilliant developers. No other area in tech moves so fast, but. I, I feel like there's a, there's a there's a big divide between how much has been built and how many technical breakthroughs we have seen, and the adoption that uh, we have seen outside of like very very nerdy circles or outside of like you know number of go up circles. Um, so like in in your perspective, like what what are the largest hurdles for adoption in crypto today? Um, good question. I think. Uh... Well, I think we still have, like, I think we made a lot of progress on um, on actually like technical onboarding and uh, and also scalability, like usability has uh, has actually improved quite significantly in my opinion. Um, so onboarding someone, for example, to poorly market uh, doesn't require crypto knowledge anymore. Mm -hmm. You get an account, you can fund it with uh, like a credit card. Uh, you don't have to worry about transaction fees. So it's kind of like really from this perspective, I think very well executed. Um, 
I think what generally like an expertise is generally quite missing in the space is uh, any sort of, I think business development and also marketing generally is really underserved in like, it's just not where we are knowledgeable in. <laughs> like, oh, there's plenty of marketing. It's just not about products. <laughs> yeah, but I think most, like, found, like most founders are more come really from a technical perspective. And uh, yeah, I, I think it's still like kind of too early to, to really embrace the mass market. <laughs> um, like, I, I don't know. I don't know. What, what is the product that you think is the best, has the best marketing that is actually a decentralized application? Well, uh, I, I really like Yearn for what? Yearn Finance. Yeah. Um, I, I think that, I, I mean, you know, their image is quite controversial. I, I understand that. And it's not necess it doesn't necessarily have mass appeal. Uh, but I really like their honesty and their transparency. And instead of, like, I, I, the reason I trust them is not because I know they have the right controls in place. The reason I trust them is because, like, everything that they are is just out there on the, in the world and I can see it. Um, so for, for me, that does a lot. I'm not sure that how this translates to, to most other folks, though. Yeah, yeah, but do you think they, I think Yearn for me is also a product, uh, I'm not sure like how many users do they actually have and do they, I mean, they're far from, I mean, for me, it seems like it's kind of a narrow user space they currently serve. And uh, for me, it's a question, like if you talk about more adoption, yeah, then where, where should those users come from? Like, I think we converted now some exchange users, <laughs> like centralized exchange users mm -hmm. to DeFi users because of very high yields. Uh, and NFTs, uh, that was like, that was great. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we have to have just, I think, bigger incentives. I think at some point when the incentives are strong enough, then people will try to deal with it. <laughs> like for example, yield farming, uh, I think quite a few users uh, got into crypto just for yield farming yeah. now as well. And that's great. And I think NFTs also kind of had the same effect for other, for another group of people. Um, but the question is, how can we keep it up? Yields are down, NFT hype is still there, but it's definitely not as high as before. So I think we just, yeah, with new innovation, we create new sort of hype cycles and slowly get more users. Um, but if you want to really go like broader and really mass market adoption, then we have to make more steps towards these users and not expect them to come to our platform, yes. but rather integrate the way other way around. Yeah. Which is how a product person should think. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, but um, most people don't, yeah. yeah. So um, i got a couple more questions for you. So like uh, also in this vein, like uh, what areas in, in crypto, and this kind of ties into what you were just saying, do you feel are persistently underexplored? Like where do, would you like to see faster development? I think what, what is still the most missing is enough product people. <laughs> people that think more really, like we have built a lot of technical solutions. <laughs> and I think this, those have been developed quite fast. Like we have been building, that, that's not slow. Like I think we, in terms of technology, uh, we have been pretty fast. Of course, it would be nice to have already sharding and all this stuff, but well. <laughs> well, it's been it, less than 10 years. This is already insane. Yeah, and so I think from a technology perspective, I'm actually, yeah, I think we made good progress or like we found solutions that are kind of mitigating that some things were kind of too slow. So I definitely don't think um, this is underserved. Uh, what is underserved is more, yeah, we need more product people in the space to actually build products that users really care about. I think this is also starting to happen uh, with like, I don't know, games like Axie Infinity. <laughs> um, That's been big. Yeah, but I feel like the entire DeFi space, for example, is still something that is really for crypto people only, or people, a few people that we converted to crypto people. <laughs> uh, but it's still something that's not really appealing for most. And it's just, it feels like it's a small circle of people that's really attracted by it. Uh, NFT had a bigger, like, it's kind of surprising, like for a long time, we were all working on DeFi, and then kind of NFTs uh, got the bigger attention in the mass market, at least. And yeah, it was maybe at first surprising, but it also makes sense because most people just don't care much about finance. <laughs> yeah, it was, a, it was a lot of fun talking about NFTs to, uh, uh, to a bunch of folks. They're like, 
but I, I don't get it. Like, it's just, it's just a thing. Uh-huh. What, what value does it have? It's just a bit of bites. Uh-huh. And then like, the more we talk, the more they realize like, that's how most art works. And, you know, it's about the history. It's about how, how many other people want the thing that you have. <laughs> and NFTs just bring that into evidence. And I, I think it's, it's, it's not my space. I'm not an artist, not a big consumer of art. I'm an engineer, but um, it's a space that I really respect because it goes a, a long way in terms of this intermediation that is very necessary in a space where like we even use the metaphor of the starved artist like you know half jokingly so uh for me that that is a really really good progress that's been happening there yeah i agree so yeah if you ask me like what i would wish would go faster it's just us building actual products that are interesting beyond like the crypto core people community um and also exploring more use cases that are not yeah not again like for the crypto core community it's something that Kind of bridges to new communities like for example vita da was a good example in my opinion mm-hmm. uh, trying to bridge uh, the gap between crypto and the research community uh, on long longevity research um how do they work uh, well it's just a dao but the dao received funds to invest into projects that do longevity research and uh, they were able to build a strong community uh, of researchers in this field um, that now collaboratively use these DAO to come to consensus to where to invest in and also use it for capital formation to raise funds. And um, yeah, that's like, something exciting for me because that's finally something that's not for the same 10 people. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and it kind of cool. restores, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, and that's generally, I think, something completely underexplored. There's so many more use cases where you could apply it and we have to do more to embrace other communities to join us. And that will just help to make sure that Ethereum is actually for everyone and not just for the same. <laughs> yeah, I agree. And uh, examples like those kind of like, you know, restore a little bit of faith in humanity because like, I, I personally think that most people are good and want to do good. And they're constantly slapped in the face in this, with the systems that they're presented in which they can do good and not be rewarded or be ignored. And I think that crypto presents an opportunity for us to restructure how that works. And because you can create uh, you can create your own economy and you can module your own community around that economy, which, I mean, it's essentially a mechanism for coordination. I think that we have the opportunity to reinvent a lot about how we can like uh, be together and work together and uh, finally like become the humans that uh, we should have been all along. Um, so I'm very excited about that too. Um, all right, I'm, uh, I've taken a bunch of your time already. Last question, uh, if there was one thing that you could change overnight in crypto, what would it be? I think clear, like if, if regulation would be clear, that would be very helpful because I think that's also keeping a lot of people away and makes a lot of people's lives really hard. <laughs> um, so if you would have from tomorrow on like clear regulation of how DeFi is treated and how uh, dApps are treated and what are the requirements for users to participate, blah, blah, blah. And that would be kind of known (laughs) and kind of established. That would be extremely helpful. Um, Definitely cause a lot of headache, even for everyone in crypto right now, taxation is a nightmare, complete nightmare. Yes. Uh, And uh, I think if you want to have mass adoption, then it's necessary that we have more clarity on this. my accountants absolutely loved it when I told him about Alpha Homora and how it worked. And when I gave him a list of what I was doing over there, he just went completely insane. I think he's going to quit on me at some point. Um, yeah, I agree with you. I think that predictability would do wonders to the space and um, not just to, you know, not just for current founders to kind of know what to expect and how to navigate what's ahead, but also for people to join. Like I've, I've heard from people that they think that this is super interesting. They're concerned of coming into the space because they don't want to be associated. And uh, of course, this is slightly problematic. And I think that the current narrative doesn't help. And so regulation will help a little bit with that if it is properly done. We can only hope and vote. Um, yeah. <laughs> Stefan, thank you so much. This has been absolutely priceless. Uh, I hope that we get to speak again in the future. And uh, you know, keep making doses awesome. And I'll keep using it. <laughs> uh-huh. Thanks. It was very nice talking to you. <laughs> yeah. Likewise. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.